All right, welcome to the Lift Heavy Run Long podcast, episode number 14. We have with us today Janice Ferguson of Bandit CrossFit. She's going to be our guest, and she is a licensed L1, L2 trainer with CrossFit. She is a, you have a lot of qualifications, Janice. <laughs> I do a, a lot. Level one, a level one sports performance coach for the USAW, assistant coach at Mississippi Weightlifting Club, 2012 CrossFit Regionals Games competitor, an elite obstacle racer, a contestant on 2014 <laughs> American Ninja Warrior, yeah. which is like the coolest thing I've ever heard, yeah. and 2016 Stone Cold Steve Austin's Broken Skull Challenge competitor. Yes, that's my favorite one out of all of those. <laughs> oh, man. How is that for a guest? Wow. Uh, I was telling Wilson before you got on about watching the Broken Skull show, mm -hmm. and uh, I was so excited when it came on. I was like, she's just going to crush this, and so it got all the way down to the end. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like screaming at the TV, and, and, and then, like, you, you're, I guess, just to explain, like, they put you in this circle with this girl, right? Yeah, like, they do. And, and you're going to have to wrestle each other, mm -hmm. and the first person to be pushed out of the circle loses. Yes, right? that's right. That's right. right. And and like it happened so quickly, like your your little toe barely went outside the <laughs> It was my hand. And it was my hand. Oh, your hand. We, and we fell like, and she just took that opportunity and boop, popped my hand uh, out. I was like, oh, this is BS. I was like, Yeah. A lot of people were saying that, but you know, we have to give her credit too. I mean to, to think that quickly you know, the rule is the rule. She's an awesome athlete. Um, I was disappointed obviously and I would love a rematch, but you really have to give um, her credit. I actually knew Cassidy before we went on the show together. Okay. So when I saw her show up, I was like, oh, good gosh. My work is going to be cut out for me because she's a phenomenal athlete, and she would be a great guest for your show because she likes to lift heavy and run long-ish. Um, she's really not into, like, ultras or running long, but she's a Spartan racer as well. And, and she's her just name? her name is Cassidy Watton. And she's a phenomenal athlete. I really uh, look up to her. She's a very positive person, and I think she'd be a great person for your show just because of her philosophies. So, how did you end up? Uh, how did you get yourself on that show to begin with? Well, we watched it since the very beginning, and the very first episode. I actually knew um, a friend of mine. I have several friends that have been on the show. Um, just through obstacle racing, knowing them, and a couple CrossFit friends. So we watched the very first episode, and I was like, wow, that is really something that fits me just because I, you know, little country girl, grew up wrestling cows and people and brothers and boys and uh, running and just being very active. And it really suited my background because you have to be not only strong and have endurance, but you also have to be able to get physical with other people and not be afraid of it. Um, so I was like, that is a great show for me. So we watched the first two seasons. I always tell my daughters, I have two teenage daughters, um, 17 and 15, and I would say, man, I need to be on that show. I need to be on that show. So one day my daughter, Casey, I was talk, I was lecturing or giving them a mom talk about you know, trying to inspire them to just go after things that they want to do. Don't let anything hold them back. And she said, yeah, kind of like you always tell us you're going to go on the Broken Skull, but you never apply. And I was like, oh, you got me. So I went the very next day, and I applied for the show. And they called me within three days. Um, I guess they just looked at my profile, and then they got to talking to me, and we had to do, like, a Skype interview. And from there, they are like, oh, we want you on the show. You're a world champion wild hog catcher. Uh, you, that's not on my, my uh, bio on my uh, website. <laughs> How can but you I, leave that <laughs> off of your website? <laughs> I probably need to add that. But, uh, yeah, my husband and I, we... We, hunt, we used to hunt wild hogs a lot. I don't really do it anymore since I opened the gym. I kind of dedicate all my spare time to doing gym stuff. But um, we used to hunt wild hogs, and we would catch them uh, live. And we went to some um, hog catching competition, and we caught the hog and won a belt buckle. <laughs> We're the world champion wild hog catchers. Uh, my so. day and my life just continues <laughs> to get better. If you have a fan club, I want to <laughs> sign up for the Platinum membership. Right. I just like to do crazy stuff. I just enjoy it. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. Okay. You, you said that you grew up wrestling and with brothers. And did you say wrestling cows or did you say yes. wrestling and cows? 
wrestling cows. Yeah, you just I used to also do um, rodeo. So we would have there's something called like shoot dogging where you'd have to get the the cow would come out of the chute, you'd have to take it and uh, you know wrestle it to the ground. So we did stuff like that growing up too. I used to run barrels. I I'm, loved horses. I grew up on horses. And I used to do a lot of, um, you know, outdoorsy stuff with my horse. Since I had kids, I really stopped doing that. But I still have that in my heart, and that's you're never going to take that away from me. That's a fantastic sport. My cousin was a world champion uh, steer wrestler, or he competed yeah. in the world championship yeah. of the rodeo. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the, the shoot dogging is like the steer wrestling, except you're not on a horse. You're sitting outside of the chute waiting for the the steer to come out at you. So you don't really have a horse to dismount to get onto it. You just kind of have to catch it and, and do the best you can with it. That's a tough deal. It doesn't look as <laughs> – what you see on TV is not what you see uh, when you're on the back end of a horse. Yeah, that's right. Of a stall. That's right. So, so how, you've always been athletic? Did you do – Yeah, I did. I, when I was in high school, I started – which we grew up on a farm. But um, so my parents, it wasn't really – most of my friends grew up playing baseball, playing t-ball. That was kind of like their extra time. Well, our extra time was spent, you know, picking corn and weeding gardens and picking up pears so the bees don't get them and things like that. And finally, in eighth grade, I was at PE one time, and my coach, uh, Romero, he saw me running at PE and was like, wow, you're a really good runner. You should try out for track. I was like, well, I've never thought about doing that, but I'd always been really good at it. At field day, I was always like the fastest girl in school, faster than the boys. You know, back, girls and boys are kind of equal in middle school. You know, past middle school, boys start to pass the girls up. Um, so I went out for track, and I actually qualified for the state track meet in eighth grade um, in the 800. And my coach used to bring me back and forth to practice. He used to do my shoes for me. You know, my parents would pick me up too, but they worked so hard, they weren't really able to help support as much as most parents, my you know, most of my peers' parents were able to. Um, and then by the time I was 16, I had broken the state record in the mile, in the indoor mile. I had a 526. That was in 1993-ish. Um, so by that time, I was being recruited by a lot of, not recruited because they couldn't contact me then, but I had letters from Ole Miss and Duke and um, LSU, Southern Miss would send me letters wanting me to come run for college for them. Well, the state track meet happened, the outdoor meet happened two, week, two months later, and I got second place in that meet. I didn't beat the girl that I'd beat in the indoor meet, and something happened. I guess my maturity level wasn't there. I'd never been beat before, and I just quit. I quit running. I felt like I'd let my school down because I was in the newspaper frequently because I ran the mile, the two mile, the 800, the mile relay, and the um, eight, the, they call it, I think now the four by four, but I call it the mile relay. And then I also ran sometimes the 400 um, in one meet. And I would always, every team I was on, we would win. And um, it was just devastating to be 16 years old and not to understand that failure is an important part of success. Like, for me, that failure felt so fatal because I was second place and that wasn't good enough. Um, so I started partying and doing things that took away from my track career. Well, you're not the first 16-year-old to do something like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's why I push my children to, to really take advantage of their gifts. Both of my daughters, um, I've been blessed to have daughters with athletic gifts and talents. Uh, one of them is a phenomenal runner. They're both actually really good runners, but the oldest one um, is a basketball through and through, and the youngest one really enjoys running. So I really try to push them to take advantage of those gifts because those sports can take you really a long way if you have the talent for it, but it, it also helps teach you lessons that, um, you know, maybe I, I didn't really get a chance to, to learn yet. So I, I didn't start learning those lessons until I was 30 when I saw the CrossFit Games. I saw the CrossFit Games documentary in 2009, and I was like, wow, that's something I think I could do. And I just really started to pursue CrossFit at, at that point in time. I was like, this is what I've been missing my whole life. I've heard so many people tell me stories like that. When they saw it, they're like, oh, that's that's me. That's You just fit into it. So that's really um, how I fell into uh, CrossFit. And I'd never touched a barbell before. You know, we just ran. Back in high school in 1993, you didn't really do – girls didn't lift, first of all. They weren't – they weren't – the weight room was full of – all these what are these machines that do just one thing and you know and, oh it's great it's a great thing but we didn't really do do any of that 
So what happened after you were 16, between the time oh. you were 16 and then, <laughs> well, and then how, how long was it before you? Yeah, it gets better. Um, I met my husband when I was 20 at a bar, and we got married about a month and a half later because I was pregnant. So, and we've been married for 18 years now. Wow. But um, that, whenever I got pregnant with my first daughter, that really um, gave me like a, a kick in the butt, I guess you might would say, because I was working like as a veterinary technician, kind of living check to check, living for the weekend, just like a typical uh, teenager, 18, 19, 20 year old would do. And then I started college then, because I told my husband, I was like, We're, we are now responsible for another human being. It's not just you and I. He was in the military, and of course, he would deploy, and I had a lot of time to go to school while he was deploying. And so my first, from my 20s until my 30s, a lot of it was spent just being a mom and trying to set our house up because when we started out we didn't have anything. I mean I didn't have a vehicle. We didn't have a house to live in. He had to go uh, He had to go and uh, try to get a loan to buy me a wedding ring and they wouldn't even give him a, a loan to buy a wedding ring so he bought my wedding ring for $150 from a pawn shop. Um, so we just, we had nothing. So we spent the 20s to the 30s trying to care for both of our children and set ourselves up. I finished college. I went to Baylor University and I graduated from there in 2004 because we moved to Texas. My husband's from Texas, so we lived there for about five years. And I absolutely love Texas. But um, we moved back after Hurricane Katrina. So when Hurricane Katrina came, we wanted to, I wanted to come back home to be with my parents so my children could be around them. And I started working as an event planner. I have a degree in journalism and marketing. Um, I started working at a casino as an event planner, conference coordinator. And that took me away from my family too much. So we decided I would be a teacher. So I, in May of 2008, I decided to quit my job at the Beau Rivage, which was um, planning events for them. And I decided to become a teacher. I was teaching by August of 2008, the same year, and um, with the alternate route. Mississippi has a great program called the alternate route that you can do to become a teacher. And then that's when I became a teacher. That's whenever I really came back to the fitness because I had a little bit of time off. You know, before I had hardly any time off. And teachers don't get if your teachers are out there listening to this, don't get me wrong. Teachers do not have a lot of downtime. Like summertime is spent planning, um, spring break is spent planning. But I did have a little bit more free time than normal and I was on my kids' same schedule. So that's when I started coming into CrossFit, was really when I became a teacher. So you, you saw you saw the CrossFit games and you thought you wanted to, that looked awesome, so you wanted to get into that, and so, yeah. did, so did you go, what did you do then? Did you just go join a gym, or what happened? Well, actually, I actually heard of CrossFit in 2005 while I was still living in Texas, and I used to do CrossFit on a little concrete slab with dumbbells, and I had like a broomstick, and um, just any a jump rope. I, I had never touched a barbell, so I'd have to spend like 45 minutes to figure out, well, what's a clean? And what is this? If you don't have a, a, a rowing machine, what do you do instead? And they're like sumo deadlift high pull. So I was trying to learn that all by myself. And then it just it quit. So 2009, I'd already known about CrossFit. I had known it was a great way to get in shape. You know, the first video I ever watched in 2005 was of um, Greg Amundsen and Annie Sakamoto doing um, Fran. And then I also saw the Nasty Girls video with Nicole Carroll and um, Annie Sakamoto, I can't remember the other one. That, but I, I just re recall watching that and seeing them doing these pull-ups, and I was like, when are they going to stop? I mean, they're not, okay. I mean, how can they just keep going? It just amazed me to see what they were doing. And I was like, I, a lot of people, I'm a CrossFit gym owner, so I talk to people that um, want to do CrossFit a lot or, or people that want to get fit, and they're, they look at that video, and that would make them say, oh, no, that's way too intense for me. I could never do that. I'm the kind of person that looks at that and be like, I want to do that. Not, oh, how, you know, I can't do it. Like, how can I do that? So I think there's a, a people out there that are like me, but there's just not a lot of us. And unfortunately, you can't build your gym on people that are like me that see those videos of people doing great things, and that attracts you. A lot of people, you have to try to let them know, well, you don't have to do 50 pull-ups in a row to do CrossFit. You don't have to clean and jerk 335 pounds to do CrossFit. You know, we're going to scale it for you and teach it. So in 2009, I went back to CrossFit because I knew that that was something I wanted to do, but I didn't know about the CrossFit games. And that's when I was on the journal, which was a place I had spent a lot of time on um, in 2005. 
Um, I went back to the CrossFit Journal and I ran across the documentaries. I think Savon did those, um, the 2009 games. Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Smith, uh, Carrie Kepler, uh, Jeremy Teal was on it. That was the year Jason Khalifa famously did not, you know, he fell out on the, the 7K mountain run. Um, so I was just really um, impressed by what they were doing. Heather Bergeron was, was part of that and Laura DeMarco, or, you know, she was part of it. And all of those ladies just really, they inspired me more than intimidated me. And I was like, I think I can do that. So that's when I decided at that point in time, I'm going to go to the CrossFit Games. So I tried it on my own for a couple months. And all the equipment that we needed, oh, sorry, my phone. It's like ringing in my ear. <laughs> One of my runners is calling me. Um, I tried a lot of the stuff on my own. But, like I said, I'd never had barbell experience. So here I am thinking I'm going to the CrossFit Games. I'd never even touched a barbell in my life. And um, I couldn't do a pull-up. I couldn't do a push-up. I couldn't do any of that. Um, but I knew I was going to find a way to have it to get it done. And I started on my own, and I just thought, like, well, this, this isn't working. I can't, how many times can you sub a sumo deadlift high pull for a rower? And I don't even know if I'm doing it correctly. Anyway, so I joined a CrossFit gym in 2010. And that was, from there, I walked in. My first thing I told the owner when I walked in was, I'm here because I'm going to go to the CrossFit Games. Mm -hmm. And here's this little thin, frail-looking person with just this determination. And I said, and one day, I'm going to open my own gym. Probably not the right thing that you say to a CrossFit gym owner whenever you come in, but I'm all naive and, you know, thinking, well, surely she'll support me because CrossFit's a supportive community and this and that the other. And by 2011, I was 61st in the region in the Open. And um, so I one point one one placement away from going to regionals in 2011. Wow. So, so 2011 to 2012, I, was, um, I changed my programming style. I changed my gym that would allow me to do a lot more uh, lifting. I started to follow the outlaw way back before it was, now it's kind of not so much prominence, but... I did start following the, the strength programming from the outlaw, and um, I qualified for regionals in 2012. I was actually one and done with all of those. I fought tooth and nail in 2011 and did every workout two, um, sometimes three times to try to make it, and got 61st, but in 2012, I did all of them one time and made 48th place. That's the year of the seven-minute burpees. Do you oh, remember? Yeah. Yep, yeah, do you remember those? Yeah, but um, so, and... You know, just so many things have happened since then. Um, I broke my hand in 2013, and I couldn't, I, right in the middle of the Open, the second week. Oh. So I really kind of fell off there. 2014, my back locked up on me. Um, and then 2015, I, the gym started getting too busy. So I really yeah. can't, I haven't focused a lot then, oh, since then. So when you, were, when you were training to go, when you went to regionals, did you, did you have a coach at all? Or, or well, you uh, Rudy, Rudy Nelson was, um, I mean, back and forth every now and again. That's before he got real, a lot of people, like back when the blog was still like right. a word, right. word blog and whatever. So we would text back and forth. Um, he really helped me fix quite a few of my technique issues with um, my deadlift. Um, He's a great movement coach. He has a great eye for movement. So he did help me fix a couple of things. But I really just didn't have a lot of strength. I mean, the, the regionals 2012 workout with the hang cleans at 135 um, just were very heavy for me. Now, by the time 2014 or 2013 had rolled around, I had really gained a lot of strength. I was hang cleaning a lot more. I was deadlifting a lot more, squatting a lot more. My muscle ups were a lot better. And then I broke my hand. Um, I really, I felt in 2013 I would have qualified again just because I, that was probably the best conditioning or the best shape I had been in um, at that point, but it just didn't, you How know, did you break I, your hand? I was walking on my hands, and oh. I just, something grabbed this finger and pulled it, and it broke this bone right here. So it was devastating, but what it did allow me to do is... Uh, you know, you, you can't let things like that get you down because, I mean, it, for an athlete who's trying to compete at a high level, it is devastating to have something taken from you, but you can always try to focus on something else that you can work on. So I've never really skipped out of training. I mean, I dislocated my shoulder on American Ninja Warrior. 
I had um, posterior tip tendonitis and a stress fracture on my foot. And I continued to train through all of those things. And you find other things. So I really started focusing a lot on Spartan Race whenever I broke my hand. And I went to Texas to the Texas Sprint um, two weeks after I got out of the cast. And I got second place in the elite heat wow. uh, in, in that race. And it's because with my broken hand, I couldn't do a lot of lifting, but I could run. Here I was running with my little cast. I got a really good shoulder workout uh, from that. But it was um, it really led me to some different opportunities. So it was it turned out to be a good thing that I'd broken my hand. How long I keep getting these waves of, of goosebumps <laughs> uh, listening to your story? And primarily it's because it sounds like you don't do anything by the rules. It sounds like you don't take the advice of, of what no. anybody how anybody has it laid out for you. If you make up your mind to do something, yeah. clearly you just go do it. That's exactly right. And the same thing with opening this gym. I'm sure, you know, you deal, people deal with a lot of negativity in general whenever they say they want to do something outrageous or something that the, the status quo would say is impossible. Um, you know, I started, my, I started my fitness business in my backyard with a boot camp. And we moved to a park because it got too big. Then we moved to a storage shed with no running water, uh, no bathroom. We used a porta potty for the first three years of my business. And then now we're in a 6,000 square foot facility. We're nowhere near where I feel like I need to be, and I never am. I'm never satisfied. But I don't care what people think. I do. I basically do whatever I feel like I want to do. And there's nothing wrong with changing the path. If I feel like I'm on a path that I don't want to go down anymore, I just go to something different. And there's no loss in that. If I shut the doors to this gym today, it would, I could feel good about doing that if that was a decision that I made. And there would be no loss and no failure. It's just that, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. We're going to go down a different path. Um, but anything that I want to do, I want to go 100% on it and, and really try to, to focus my efforts in being successful. That's what I'm enjoying most about listening to you speak, hearing you talk to your daughters and tell them, listening to them and knowing that, that you are the example. Oh, so yeah. You're, you're going to lead by an example. I, I get hit in the face all the time by things that I want my children to do, but yet I'm too afraid to do those kinds of things. I, I yeah. listen to the haters. I, I pay yeah. attention to what they, what they have to say or what I believe that they're saying, mm -hmm. often when they're not even saying it. Well, it's a and battle. I mean, I listen to it, too. It's hard to get past, um, you know, just, you know, drama is everywhere. People are always going to knock you down and try to keep you down. And I listen. I, I hear it. But... I, sometimes I'm just so bullheaded. I'm just like, I'm not going to let that stop me. And I do try to tell my kids, especially kids. You know, I used to be a teacher, so I've taught eighth grade uh, students, middle school students. Peer pressure and what other people think are such a big, um, uh, you know, it's a big weight in a middle school child or a teenager's life. So I really try to encourage my daughters just to, to quit. There's a great book that I used to read to my students called Ignore Everybody. And it's by Hugh McLeod. And um, it basically just says people don't want you to change. And they don't want you to go out and do something that is different from them. Because it changes the dynamic of your relationship with them. It puts you on a different, you know, on a different plane or a different level than them. So they're going to try to negate what you're doing and try to pull you back down to what they're doing, which is constant, safe, and steady. But if there's something that you really, really want to do, you're going to have to be willing to, one, lose friends. When I say lose them, you're going to have to be willing to leave them behind. It's not that any of the people that I've ever worked with or, or associated myself with were not enemies. It's just that I had to know when it was time to leave them behind because they were no longer on the same path with me. And I think that's a great lesson for a gym owner because... You know, I started out um, training with a certain group of people, and we tried to, we brought them, they came into this gym with me. But everyone changes. So it, it was a very valuable lesson for me to learn that the person that I have to really look out for is myself. And I'm going to have to push myself to do what, what it is that I want to do. And they're either going to follow me, or what I'm doing is going to keep them away from me. And we're not, it's not that we're not friends, it's just that they went on a different path. So I try to keep my girls in that. Along the lines of leaving things behind, when you got out and got a job as a writer mm -hmm. and then decided that your path was going to be in the fitness realm, mm -hmm. how did that look? Was that a scary moment? Yes. That you oh, said, my gosh. Hey, I remember when I was um, about nine, no, I was 20. I just had 
Casey, so I was probably 21, my first daughter, her name's Casey, um, and I joined a Globo gym, you know, it's called Premier Fitness, that's uh, what's down here in the, on the coast, and whenever I got in there, I was like looking at these people that were fit, I was like, I want to do this, I want to teach people how to be fit, but I had no idea how to do that, you know, I was born on a farm, I didn't know anything, when I grew up, my parents thought I should be a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary, and that's what they taught you in school. They taught you typing, you're a girl, you're going to be a nurse, you're going to be a teacher. Whenever I finally made that commitment, um, just CrossFit really, that's why I'm so loyal to CrossFit. Um, the confidence, Greg Glassman always says, the, the greatest adaptation of CrossFit is what happens between the ears, and I know I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here right now, but that confidence that I gained from going into those workouts and finishing them and gaining new skills, like my first push-up, I remember my first pull-up. I remember the first time that I was able to deadlift, my, you know, two times my body weight. I remember all of those gains. And when you fight and you fight and you fight to achieve those gains, it carries over into your personal life. So once all that, that gain started to happen, there was never any doubt that if I wanted to, to, to make that jump into helping people and have a career in fitness, that I could do it if I wanted to. So there was a time you crossed the threshold from not being able to do a pull-up oh, yeah. to being a games competitor. Absolutely. When the first time I walked into a CrossFit gym, I couldn't do a pull-up. I couldn't do a push-up, which I call, I couldn't do a man push-up. That's what I call man push-ups. I could do them for my knees, but I couldn't do a full push-up. I couldn't, no way did I ever think I would, you know, I knew I was going to do a muscle-up, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew that it was going to happen, and I would put the work in. And on the Mississippi coast, uh, unfortunately, CrossFit's just, there's not a hotbed of CrossFit down here. And we don't really have a lot of CrossFit coaches and that can help you. So we're kind of behind the curve. So whereas people that are in Atlanta and in Dallas and in California have access to these great minds of people who have dedicated themselves to fitness and coaching, um, we just didn't really have that. So I was teaching myself, but I, which a lot of people went to regionals on their own in 2012. There's a lot different client, uh, atmosphere at regionals in 2012. These days, it's more along the lines of you're a professional athlete, you have a coach, um, but there are very few people that had coaches in, back in 2012. Now, the ones making it to the games definitely were the ones that had a coach, but I was self-taught besides that help from the outlaw. The outlaw way really cemented the importance of barbell and, and weightlifting to me. Um, it really helped, gave me a lot of confidence in that. But yeah, well, there's there not a girl in the country, in the world, who does CrossFit, who doesn't need or want to hear what you just said in regards to going from not being able to do a pull-up. Oh, yeah. I tell my members you... that all the time. Every time someone new comes in these doors and they feel like they're, un, they're incapable, I always try to tell them my story that I'd never touched a barbell, and now I, you know, I work my way up to a 185-pound clean and jerk, which is not a lot in, in the sense of a CrossFit Games or regionals competitor. But for someone who was self-taught, you know, that definitely was a, something I was very proud of. I'd worked my way up to a 130-pound snatch. I had a 300-pound deadlift and a 250-pound back squat on my own, someone who had never touched a barbell in their life. Now, I know there are genetic predispositions for people to kind of develop that, and I think I have a natural ability for that. But I try to tell people that that doesn't have to stop them. Their inability doesn't have to stop them because everything we do in this gym, especially in my gym, is scalable. We have four levels of progressions for a, a squat, a simple air squat. You know, if you can't do an air squat properly, I've got three other things, four other methods that I can try to give you to help you to achieve a proper air squat. So uh, it definitely is something that um, I think CrossFit has trouble with the CrossFit Games and the regionals. You know, whenever they people walk in here and they see our coaches training, it scares them. What they need to see are the regular people training. Regular people are doing the same exact, uh, the same things that we're doing, except in a different. Um, they're all according to their own ability. I saw where you had made the podium in a 50k. Yeah, so you did I did. Some distance running. Oh, I love it. And hey, that's why people don't get me because I mean, I love. Well, I went to a weightlifting meet. I qualified for um, the seat. What is it? The um, I'm a Masters in weightlifting now, by the way. So, but I did qualify for the Masters Nationals in weightlifting. But at the same time, I went to this um, Podunk 50K called Big Butts in Clinton, Mississippi, 
and I got third place. I ran. It was 50. That's the first time I ever run that distance. It was um, 31 miles, 50k. I ran it in five minutes and 20 or five minutes. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? Five hours and 28 minutes was wow. our time on that. And we took. That's the first one we'd ever done. I did it with one of my coaches named Emily, and we ran together the whole time. We took so much time in the pit. We should not have done what we did. We spent. We changed our shoes every time. It was a six mile loop. So we would come in from the six miles, sit down, change our shoes, change our socks. We didn't want to get any blisters. We'd mm -hmm. drink. We'd eat. We didn't need all that. We just The girl that won, her name was Sarah Werner, and she's a great ultra runner. And I think her time was along the lines of uh, the four-and-a-half-hour um, mark. And I told Emily, I think we could have got at least under five hours if we wouldn't have spent so much time um, hanging out in our, our tent the whole time because we were trying to be cautious ultra runners. You know, that was our first time. The ultra people are a different uh, group of people, and I love them. It is fun. Yep. It is so much fun. I mean, they're just... It's not you go to a marathon and you feel very stuffy and everybody's got the latest and the greatest and it just feels like it's very it's a higher level of of competition I guess. or not competition but I, it's so hard to explain it but you go to yeah. an ultra and people are so laid back I mean they're they've got tents set up they're they've got their campsite set up you come through they all know your name when you're coming through I really enjoy ultras and that's something I really would like to commit my time a little bit more to if I could ever get this gym to start taking care of itself. I really want to do some more ultras. I'd love to I'd love to do some of the bigger ones like Leadville. That's been a goal of mine which would be to go to Leadville and, and complete Leadville. I would love to do the western states. I mean those are all like these big things that you know normal people don't typically do or aspire to but I definitely aspire to that. Well you're not supposed to do those things. You're not supposed yeah. to be running and lifting. Yeah, Didn't definitely anyone not. anyone teach you that? Yeah, definitely <laughs> not. And and this is what I tell people a lot because there is a lot of controversy. I'm I'm entrenched into the Spartan community. I'm pretty, you know, I'm an old, what they might call, what do you call it, an OG Spartan racer because I've been around Spartan race for a while. And I used to get a lot of flack because I did CrossFit and you know the endurance, the traditional endurance community doesn't support the CrossFit or weightlifting um, that it's of any benefit to you. And I don't know if y'all know who Hobie Call is. He's one of the top Spartan racers. So he and I used to debate a lot about CrossFit. And he would show me some of the workouts that he was doing to prepare himself for Spartan race. And he was doing a lot of um, like high intensity or, or or longer aerobic effort workouts with push-ups and burpees and doing stuff with sandbags. And I was like, Hobie, that's really similar to what we do in CrossFit. I mean, it's not really any different. I think that um, people just don't understand what CrossFit is, and I think it's because that first paper Greg Glassman wrote about what is fitness, he wrote, you know, the anaerobic, anaerobic training can help to develop your aerobic um, system, and a lot of CrossFitters have lacked, you know, neglected their aerobic systems, but I think now that's a thing of the past because I see a lot of the CrossFit coaches these days and athletes are now focusing on their aerobic systems and doing the longer uh, mm -hmm. workouts and they're using the barbell to get stronger because you know those 10 I know I'm like going off on all these tangents I just love CrossFit and I love talking about it wow. you've got those 10 general physical skills and when you're trying to improve in all of those areas you can't tell me that a distance runner can't benefit from improved strength improved flexibility improved agility improved power all of those can help a distance runner. All of those can help a, a Spartan racer. And the barbell, I mean, here, here's my bias as a USAW Level 1 sports performance coach. The barbell is a phenomenal way to develop power and speed and neuromuscular adaptations. So it just to me, they, they complement each other rather than taking away from, from each other. I just think people that don't understand that, you know, they want to stick with what they've done in their little box. And, yep. and we're just going to run, and we're going to run and try to be as thin as possible, you know, not thinking about how the, the muscle can help prevent injury for normal people. If you're a Kenyan, I just watched something last night about these uh, the Kenyan tribe uh, training. These two um, New Zealanders went over there to go train with them. Those people are genetically designed to run. I mean, you're just watching them run. They look like gazelles. Just mm -hmm. everything is so effortless. But when you have a 200-pound man you know, a five foot ten, two hundred pound man who's been inactive for fifteen years, he doesn't need to run a hundred miles a week to prepare for a marathon. His body's not designed for that. So can we not just help him to have a little more muscle 
um, endurance, a little more power, a little more strength to help him endure what he's about to do to go through the marathon, I think that's the best use of his, his time is to become an all-around athlete. He's not trying to run a 204 marathon. He's just trying to complete it and feel good the next week and the, and the coming days afterwards. How much time do you put into running? Well, anymore with this, we would just moved to a new facility, and that's kind of sucked the time out of my athletic uh, pursuits as of late. But whenever I was training, I would probably run um, when I was training for the the ultra, or you know, if you talk to an ultra runner, a 50k is not an ultra, but to a CrossFitter, 30 miles is, is a is a great distance. I was running on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I would wait. Do, who says that? <laughs> and the ultra, the oh, yeah. ultra runners. Yeah, there are some people that say that, but I call it an ultra myself. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, don't I do talk too. to those people. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Step over twenty six point one. It's an ultra. <laughs> well, I did. A, I did a fifty k for. I still haven't run a marathon yet. I need to do that. Um, but you know, I'm I'm a natural runner, so I don't really recommend that people that come in my doors do what I did to train for it, just because I have a natural running ability. Um, but I was doing CrossFit, of course, five days a week. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five days a week. And I would run on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thursdays was my off day from CrossFit. And then Saturdays was a double day. Saturdays and Tuesdays were double days. I would do running and then CrossFit um, on those days. Now, I do, I don't, I haven't figured this out yet about myself because at 2013, I started dealing with a lot of injuries. And I don't want to attribute it necessarily to my training habits, but I think like my gym, that's when I opened my gym, and that's when my life started to change and I started to gain a lot of stress. If you're, and the CrossFit gym owners out there can attest to this, when you're a sole person owning your gym, my husband doesn't really run the business with me. I'm the only one that owns this gym. Um, he does stuff to help me, like building stuff, but he doesn't train, he doesn't work out. Um, you're a coach. And the head coach, that's 40 plus hours a week spent on those duties. And then you're the CEO, president, owner of your business. That's a 40 hour work week in itself. And when you're trying to dedicate you know, 80 hours a week to your gym, the training, you're spending 20 hours a week training, you know, when do you have time to sleep? When do you have time to be with your family and be with your kids? Um, so I think I started to deal with some adrenal fatigue. I was never diagnosed with that but I was just severely tired. I could not stay injury free. You know, the dislocation, the broken hand, the tendonitis in my foot lasted for over a year and then I had a stress fracture in that same foot. Um, I trained through all of those things and I competed as I could um, when I was healthy, but I really, I don't know that I would recommend for a normal person to do what I was trying to do, or when I say a normal person, like a mom who's just trying to to be a weekend warrior, I wouldn't recommend them training two to three hours a day, twice a day, and then have a full-time job and try to keep up with their kids and their husband and, and whatnot. How strict are you from the standpoint of, of your training? Are you regimented? Do you have a plan for the week, or do you just train as, you, as your body feels like training? Yeah, well, okay, so in December, let me, let me get, let's go back a little bit. In 2014, I actually hired a coach which if I think if someone is trying to, to have has high aspirations for competitiveness, I really think they need to take it out of their own hands and invest that money and put it into the hands of someone else. And I actually employed um, Mike McElroy of CrossFit 2717 yeah. Iron Sharp, which I love. I think he, he helped me to repair myself. He helped me to um, find balance. He's just a phenomenal guy, a phenomenal coach. I highly recommend him. And he worked with me from July of 2014 all the way until December of 2015. And I really like that. He, he used to train. I don't know how much he's under OPEX anymore, um, but OPEX is kind of where he kind of his start. And it is a little bit different than the traditional CrossFit um, methodology. Now I think he's with the tra training think tank. Um, but, but balance in your life is more important than your training volume is really kind of what we came to this solution, what was my solution to help me. Um, I couldn't train three hours a day anymore. So we got my training sessions down to one hour a day 
and it really worked for me, especially with my base that I had built since 2010. Um, it, it really, I felt the strongest that I've ever been was last summer when I went to compete on Broken Skull Challenge. I mean, it just, I felt like there was nothing that I couldn't do. I mean, I picked up that, the, the girls felt like they weren't of any consequence to me. And I don't mean that to be, like, disrespectful, but I, I felt like I could have, the workouts were, were so short. When we had to fight, we had to go do the barrel thing, and then I had to go run down and wrestle um, Cassidy at the end. I wasn't even tired. I wasn't even winded. I felt so strong and so good, and I think that's from a solid year of listening to my body, listening to my coach, and even though I wasn't training, sometimes I'd have to miss training sessions with Mike because of the gym ownership or because I became a cross-country coach, um, but I still... I just think it was so good for me to give that training up to someone else. I didn't have to worry about it anymore. He And he would know what my schedule was, and he would work around that, and he would really help me. Um, so did you, I, actually, uh, did you, you actually go see him? Was it like one-on-one? -on -one? No, he, you know, I'm in, this is, I'm in Biloxi. Yeah, so I wasn't we're sure about, how close his gym was. Yeah, I mean, we could see each other. He comes down here sometimes. His wife's family is from here. But for the most part, it was remote. I would send videos of myself lifting. Um, he could. I would send videos of myself um, doing the gymnastics movements. Of course, he helped me rehab my dislocated shoulder. Um, so we went from no muscle ups and no more pull ups and no more toes to bar to back to my. I was actually better than I was before with my um, shoulder strength, and I just I really recommend t taking that. Like especially for me because if it's on if it's on my piece of paper if it's like the outlaw stuff or if I was following uh, what's the new one people follow now Misfit or any of the other ones like Invictus there's so much and if it's on there I'm gonna do it and I, you know I caught myself doing it yesterday I just did an impromptu wad with one of our members here he needed to go and he wrote up a wad I did not want to do handstand push-ups because I haven't been training. Um, I shouldn't be doing handstand push-ups because the I don't I haven't earned the right to do handstand push-ups anymore because you know my neck's not as strong as it used to be my shoulders aren't as strong well they were there and he was doing them and I said okay I'm going to do them and I did and you know I just I can't be trusted because whenever you get people around you you want to do what they're doing and you want to you want to, to I, I'm competitive I want to be the best. So I I want to let him do five handstand push-ups faster than me. I needed to beat him. So um, for sure, I recommend that. I know that probably doesn't answer your question because it's kind of like a roundabout mm -hmm. way because I'm not really training consistently right now. Um, I stopped with Mike in December just because I knew I was going to open this new gym, and I told him it's a waste of time. I'm only training once or twice a week of the stuff you're sending me, and it's more stress than what it's worth. Um, so now I'm trying to get in anytime I can, three to five times a week. Um, it's just I just want to maintain because I know I'm going to return. I mean, I know I'm 39 and I'm getting old now, but I feel like I'm going to return back to competing again, hopefully by next year. My oldest daughter is going to be um, gone this year. She's a senior, and she's going to – she's being recruited by several Division One basketball programs, so we're really focusing on that for her right now. And then once she's – committed, then I can kind of go back. Because we travel every weekend to a diff different college, to a different camp. And then, I know this is like so everywhere, she just tore her ACL last Monday. So we're having a lot of um, rehab with that now. So she's just like me, though. She's a fighter. And her colleges have been sticking with her, so I'm really happy and, and excited for that. But she's got a long road ahead of her to rehab um, until she returns to play. I don't know how you manage your time. Oh, it's like, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of stuff, and running that gym by yourself, that's that's a huge deal. Yeah, it's, it's I love it. I love people. I love to help people. I love fitness. I love doing hard stuff. Mm -hmm. You have any, I mean, have you heard about the CSU Iron? I mean, I, I don't know how long you have to talk about to me, but have you heard about the CSU Iron? Uh-uh. We oh have more gosh. time than you have. I'm sure of that. Okay. We have. Oh, no, I have plenty of time to talk about the CSU Iron. All this right. is something your people that are crazy like me out there would really appreciate this event. It's in California, and it's the category is called Extreme Adventure. So that's kind of the category. Think of, and I don't want to call it Death Race, 
but have you ever heard of the death race, the yes. Spartan death race? Okay, yes. so it's kind of spawned from that, and a lot of the, pe the people that put it on are death racers. Mm -hmm. So it's very unique in that you were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I think about GORUCK, it's kind of along that lines. Mm -hmm. You have a weird gear list that you have to get together every year, and you're going to go out and compete for 30 hours plus with, you know, 50 to 80 other crazy people like yourself. And um, like this year's gear list was a baby doll. Um, what did we else did we have to have? Uh, we had to have some jewelry cording. We had to have diapers, baby diapers. We had to have um, an axe. You always have to have an axe because we chop wood. A five-gallon bucket. We had to make a PVC pipe bow, like a bow and arrow that you would shoot. Hmm. Um, so I had to make that. Shipping that is another story. Trying to get that to California was $100. The, the PVC pipe cost me five, you know, with all the materials. Um, but anyways, that's another story. Um, so anyways, you bring all this stuff with you. Oh, a saw. We had to have our own hand saw because you have to chop, you have to saw a log um, with this stuff. So you you show up and. It's just like you have all this stuff in your pack and all this you have to wear a construction vest, a fluorescent construction vest, and the race begins. And it's not a race from point A to point B. It's just like go do this and you have to do it within this amount of time or you're gonna be punished or cut from the race. And punishment is not good. You know, punishment could be going in the pond. They have this really nasty pond called Frog Lake. Um, one of the challenges we had, we had to bring a snorkel and a, and a goggles this year because you had to go in the pond and you had to put your head under the water for 15 minutes and just breathe out of your snorkel for 15 minutes. We had to carry a five-gallon bucket full of water through a creek. We had to fill it up at a waterfall, get water food coloring in it, and it had to be all the way full. Or at least I did mine all the way full. I don't know about other people. But um, you had to carry it three miles back up the mountain to camp. And that was really tough. You know, you've already been up for 12 hours overnight, and you're on this night hike. And, I, oh, man, I broke, I hurt my hand really bad. I actually had to stop and go get an x-ray in the race because they thought I had broken my hand. You have how many to, hours did you say this race was? Uh, 30 hours is about how long I lasted in it. They, they went a little bit longer. I went last year, too, and I failed at one of the challenges, and I got out at 19 and a half hours. This year, um, I lasted for 30. You don't ever know when it's over because it's over when they say it's over. So you just kind of have to be prepared for anything. The last hike was really tough. We had to hike 7.1 miles up a mountain. Um, it was 3,000 foot elevation. And you have, oh, I'm calling again. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like, do y'all hear that? It's like in my no. ears. Let me see if I can turn off. Okay, good. Um, you had to uh, climb, okay, seven miles, 7.1 miles up this mountain. You had to hike with a telephone pole that I had already sawed off and cut. It's about this big, 20, about 20 pounds. And I had to screw my name in it with gold screws with a screwdriver. So I had, you know, 50 gold screws, no more, no less. You had to screw your name into it. So I had to bring this up to the top of this mountain and then bring it back down. And you had about four hours to complete it. I was averaging, my first couple of miles were about 20 minute miles, and then as you get to the top, I started hallucinating because I'd been up for, you know, 25 hours already working, and we'd already covered probably, you know, 25 miles in, in the race, um, but I started hallucinating. My last two miles were 30 minutes. It took me 30 minutes to go the mile for the last two miles, so 30 apiece. Um, so it took me an hour to walk two miles. And then you had to run back down. And I missed the time cut off for that event by 26, or that, that time hack um, for 26 minutes. So I was disqualified from the event. It was kind of frustrating, to be honest with you, because I'm really tough. I mean, I am mentally tough. I am physically tough. I'm strong. And I feel like I, nothing can stop me. But this event, for two years, has stopped me. This, I've got to figure out what happened and why. And mm. I've got to go back next year and try to fix that. I feel like you started this story off as a sales pitch, like to try to recruit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not so effective. fun. It's, it's so work. fun, though. It really is. When you get around, I'll tell you what's so cool about that is you go out there with 50 people who have that can-do attitude and who are just are willing to test their limits. I mean, you get around people like that, and you really get inspired. Um, and 
I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain it. I do it for the people. I don't do it necessarily because I, I think it's fun. I mean, I guess it is fun in some weird, twisted way. Mm -hmm. But it really is a great. If, if people out there want to, it's kind of like that natural progression of, you know, you start out with just a little bit. You know, you run some 5Ks, then you move on to the 10K, then maybe you might do a Spartan race, and you know, then you might do the longer Spartan race. And it just to me is that natural progression of where am I going to fail because when you start to fail at things, that's when you start to learn about yourself. You know, failure is progress. And I like to fail. I mean, I like to put myself in the position to be worried and to be afraid and to just fight through. And if I fail, I need to learn so I can get better for the next time. Learn so many lessons about yourself and failure. I'm learning that. And I'm finding a lot of freedom comes in that. And just doing things yeah. and not being afraid of the result and expecting to fail to a certain right. degree of things and just accepting that as being part of the part of the journey. Vaughn and I talk a lot about finding your bliss and yeah. what your bliss is. And I'm curious as to if you feel like you are living a life of, of bliss. If you had if time and money was not a factor, uh, would you say that you're doing what you would like to be doing? That's hard to say because I think about that a lot. I feel like the only reason I have this gym is because nobody else has a gym like this. If somebody else had a gym like this, I'd be part of it. And I'd rather be the coach and the face and, you know, coming up with cool things for people to do and meeting people out at the park and going for setting up endurance runs and, and have a lot more freedom. But I feel locked to this office. And a lot of times I see myself as... Um, how do you say this? Because I don't mean this in a negative way whatsoever, but I'm almost like a martyr because I have to be what I am to help other people have the opportunities like I have. Um, without this gym here, you know, the, the level of coaching that we have at this gym, and I don't mean this in dis disparaging any other local gym because everybody's great and have their talents, but the combined coaching uh, knowledge at this gym and the how much I foster and care for their knowledge and try to bring them up and elevate the other coaches that we have. It's just not like that at, at our other gyms. You know, that, that, that opportunity is not there. You know, my coaches can treat this gym like it's their own. They're entrepreneurs inside my business. You know, anything that they do, they use my gym like it's theirs. They just don't have to pay the bills on it. So I wish that I would make a whole lot more money if somebody else opened a gym like this and said, hey, come and work here, and you get 70% of the personal clients that you have. You get 45% of any of the special programs that you run. You want to do a boot camp? Use everything I have. 45% is yours. You know, that, that kind of a opportunity is not here for coaches in our area. And one day I hope to sell this place and maybe become a coach here. So, so then I can return back to that's where I would be living my bliss would be where I'm not on this admin side anymore. I'm not here um, married to this office for, you know, 10 hours a day and then just get to go out every now and again and hang out with my members as I coach them. Um, and then perhaps I could go back to training myself and, and return to athlete myself. So you enjoy the human aspect of it more yes. than you enjoy the business aspect. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I don't mind the business part, but you know what? Bookkeeping just, it sucks. It's terrible. Bookkeeping is awful. Keeping up with um, all of the, the little minutia, like the minute details that, you know, paying the bills and this person's calling me, asking me for, if I want to do this and trying to make those decisions. I really, I don't mind it, but and I can do it, but I don't prefer it. I want to be the face of this gym and out there with everybody um, helping them achieve their goals. How difficult do you find it to be to keep up with your nutrition Oh, you stay yes. as, as busy as you are? Oh, my goodness. It has gone downhill since we opened this gym. You know, a lot of things have changed in the past six months since spring, coming in this gym in February. And I just signed up for Eat to Perform. And I am really trying to, to be dedicated to that. Just, you know, I want to be healthy. I, I love being an athlete. I love everything about it. Um, I just... It's sometimes you just run out of time. 
So when we opened this gym, my members, I feel bad for them because they saw me eating pizza. You know, you're trying to be the leader of your gym, and here you are. Like, let's order pizza. We've been here for 12 hours painting, and, you know, we're not cooking. Bring a pizza. If you're eating pizza, it's like, girl, I don't care what I eat for these next two weeks as long as I have some energy um, about me. But I'm really trying to get back on track. We're kind of like in a rebuild. You know, I'm kind of on the uptick now. You know, it all went downhill for a little while, and now I'm here back on the uptick. So hopefully um, that will help me. Do you have a nutritional plan that you follow? Well, the Eat to Perform is um, it's really based a lot on your daily intake, how much you need to take in every day, but I will focus a lot. I like to eat quality foods. I like to eat, um, you know, I eat paleo-ish. I'll eat some cheese. and So when I am being healthy, I try to get in um, all my meals are health healthy all day, but if I want to have a piece of cake, I'm going to eat a piece of cake. If I want a donut, I'm going to eat that donut. I'm not going to restrict myself to that um, level. Now, if I were trying to train specifically for a certain event and I really wanted to dial stuff in for a three to four month period, I would be a little more strict about it and trying to keep myself um, on a more strict path. That each performs really popular. We have a lot of people in our Lift Heavy Run Long community that mm -hmm. came from Lift to Perform. My, my mm -hmm. wife does it and okay. subscribes to it. We had Thomas Cox of Meal mm -hmm. Fit yeah, come on that. here a, a few weeks ago, and I I went to the grocery store yesterday and cooked my made my first salad just uh -huh. minutes before I got on the phone with you. So with the with the Meal Fit program came about four days of absolute binge eating um, with the knowledge I was about to start. <laughs> That's what happens. Right you got to get it all out, and then you can be be straight on straight and narrow. That's how it happens. That's right. If I can just if I can just make it to where I, I spend a little bit more time on the nutritional part and less time on the binging, maybe. Yeah. It'll, right. It'll right. Well, I'll do eighty twenty. That's what everybody says. I'm eighty twenty. So it yeah, turns, well, turns into more like it turns into more like twenty eighty yeah. for, for uh, a lot I'm, of people. I'm more like eighty sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, is there anything that you want to plug as far as your as far as your gym or your training or? No, I mean nothing. Do you blog? I, I know that I you're do, a writer. I do. I do blog, but I don't get a chance to. I'm I'm been trying to get, finish up my CCU Iron blog. Um, so if anybody out there wants to to learn more about the CCU Iron, it will be very long and lengthy because you can't cover a 30-hour event in a couple paragraphs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot going back in my blog too. Um, you know, like the first time I said I was going to go do Leadville uh, Trail 100 was back in 2010, and it's still there, and it's still looking at me like saying, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? But um, there's just not enough time to do all the things that, that you want to do. But yeah, my blog is, is there. Um, my website, Band where, do you find your, where do we find your blog? Um, it's just a blog spot. It's uh, JaniceMarieFerguson.blogspot.com. I don't have a cool name for it yet, like some of my... Um, friends have really cool blog names. I just haven't come up with anything creative or cool yet um, for it. But they can definitely check out there. Some of my training that I used to do with Mike, that's how I used to keep up with my training with my coach, um, was I would post it to the blog. And he would get a kick out of reading my stuff because I'll just go into every detail. I'm so meticulous and I like to do everything perfect. And um, But yeah, all the training is there that I did after rehabbing my shoulder. So um, anybody that's dealing with some shoulder injuries, they might be able to pick up some ideas for some different exercises there. Um, we rehabbed if people that are trying to deal with foot prop, like I had a foot injury and I couldn't do any running. I did the CCU Iron last year. Um, I had not run for a year, and we had to run a half marathon in that event, in the middle of that event. And Mike had me ready for that. I mean, I was really uh, comfortable in that. So we did a lot of rowing, a lot of assault bike uh, work. So there's a lot of stuff, little nuggets in there for people who are trying to work around injuries because I wrote the book on working around injuries. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, I think we've taken up enough of your time. I can't yeah. tell you how nice it's been <laughs> talking to you. You're a very, very inspiring person. Oh, yeah. well, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all for having me. We're going to have to go ahead and book the next one because you've opened a whole can of worms with that Sisu Iron. Oh, yeah, and you yeah. haven't even heard about my new, <laughs> yeah. what I'm going to do with this adventure. I'm going to do some <laughs> endurance horse racing. So y'all need to let y'all need to keep up with that because that's going to be coming after the kids graduate. All right, cool. Well, I know that you're busy, and I really, yeah. really appreciate you uh, taking a whole hour of your time. Yeah, I appreciate y'all a lot. Nice meeting you, Janet. Yes, you too, Wilson. See you soon.
Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.